Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to Making It. I'm Terry Woolman, and this show is about creating a successful life and what that means to my guest today electronic music innovator, jazz artist, and prolific film composer, Mark Isham. I'd like to share my intention that inspires this podcast. Time passes quickly, and I've learned that we should do what's in our hearts and do it well without apologies or excuses. I encourage you to create your life and art in your own unique way and express your artistry with joy and with abandon. Be willing to work uncompromisingly for what you believe in, Success will have a better chance of finding you when you live your life with integrity, focus, and passion. Be selfish with your discipline and selfless in your performance. And don't forget to have fun along the way. If you're joining us in our live audience today, we'll be inviting questions and comments during the second half. So uh, just simply request an, uh, an invite to speak and I'll bring you up on stage and make it count. Let me tell you about my guest. Mark Isham is an artist, innovator, and composer. Isham's ability to create unforgettable melodies combined with his willingness to experiment with innovative musical palettes has earned him accolades, including Grammy and Emmy Awards, Oscar and Golden Globe nominations, and the prestigious Henry Mancini Career Achievement Award for Musical Excellence. Mark's unique musical voice is evident in his memorable scores for award-winning features, including the Oscar-winning Judas and the Black Messiah, Crash, and Oscar-nominated A River Runs Through It, which, by the way, I still love that score. One of my favorites of yours, Mark. Along with Golden Globe-winning Bobby and Golden Globe-nominated now, Isham was awarded Best Score by the International Film Music Critics, Critics Association for scoring The Black Delia. He has collaborated with top directors and artists, including Shaka King, Lynn Shelton, Swiss, Swiss Beats, Jodie Foster, George Tillman, Robert Redford, Forrest Whitaker, Tom Cruise, Brian De Palma, Chick Corea, Robert Altman, Sting, Will I Am, Cindy Lumet, and Mick Jagger. Recent projects include Bill and Ted Face the Music, Togo for Disney+, Plus, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, starring Nicolas Cage, and Hulu's limited series, Little Fires Everywhere, for which Mark garnered his sixth Emmy nomination. Mark Isham, welcome to Making It. Well, thank you very, very much. That's uh, <laughs> made, made me realize I've actually been doing something the last few years. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting to hear your credits read by somebody else, isn't it? it certainly is. It certainly yeah, is. It's, and it's, by it's the a, way, I, I love your description of your intention of this show. That was Thank, that was just, thank you. You sort of said it all. I don't know what much more I could bring to the table. It was really beautifully written. Thanks. Thank you. I, you know, one of the reasons I have been excited about getting you on the show and is is that we share the same intention. I mean, that's I can tell from your music that that's how you approach things as well. You 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 find it seems in your film scoring, but also in your early records that and and in your playing. When I hear you play trumpet that you're you're looking for the the magic you're you're yeah. it's not just about technique and and theory and notes and it's about heart and emotion it is uh, it's you know i've often thought that the creation is very different from thinking right? thinking is a very low level activity if you really if you think about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, it, and and certain tasks have to be thought about and have to be intellectually configured and worked out and, and logically conclusions arrived at. But really, creativity is much, much happens, you know. <laughs> you know, I don't know what different people's spiritual inclinations and descriptions of the universe will, will be different, but it, it's something that has to happen and you have to reach outside of your corporal being, so to speak, to, to really do it. And that's that's what I'm looking for. And I think that's what you described so eloquently because, you know, just that's that search for it. You have to find it. And it's sometimes it's harder and sometimes it's just there. You know, I, I remember speaking to a great songwriter who, who wrote a, a huge hit like in the fifties and it's, you know, huge enough that I don't think he's ever worked again. <laughs> in his life. Right. <laughs> and he said, I wrote that song in, in two minutes, but then there's the other 
1,498 songs that didn't have that quality that he had also written. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it, it's just one of those elusive and beautiful things that I think once you really experience it, you can very easy to dedicate one's life to uh, keep doing it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I I find it when I'm composing or producing or arranging or, or any of the things that I do, I, I, it's like a treasure hunt for me, you know? Yes. And I, and I remember being in, in school studying arranging composition and guitar. And I'm, I'm curious about your, your schooling as well, but I, it, you know, so much about it was about the technical aspect of it, you know, being able to sit at the kitchen table and write a big band arrangement or, you know, while the TV's on and, you know, and all that stuff. And it's great skill to be able to do that. But Absolutely. I always loved, and I really believe that, that you love the same, um, you know, finding, just finding the special way to do it, you know, yeah. and sometimes taking you know, a half hour on four bars of music because, you know, once that is everything it can be, then the universe opens up for the rest of it to fall into place. Yeah. It tells you what the rest of it has to be. Right. Yeah. What, what's your, um, what's your initial process? I mean, when you sit down to score something, do you just watch and, and, and see how it feels for you? Or do you prefer, you know, reading, reading the story, reading the script, and then seeing what comes to you. And, and do you start singing melodies into your phone as soon as they come, just so that you don't lose those moments of inspiration? Um, well, it, it is a different mindset when you're scoring something because you're, you're joining a team now. Right. And there, there's a pre conceived idea of the story and a, in and the there's a camp of, track. Well, the yeah, but even more important and earlier than that, there's there's a there's been some creative mind here that's that's put this thing in motion, right? And there's a story to be told, even if it's just the producer saw a newspaper article and said this story needs to be told, and then there's a writer that joined that, and then there's another producer, and then there's a director, and, and then there's the actors who make it their own. And so by the time a composer gets to this thing, there's been a lot of chefs coming and adding things to the pot and hopefully you will have the main chef <laughs> is controlling <laughs> this pot and allowing the right things into it so that by the time it gets to me it's it's in pretty good shape i mean there's a there's a, a, there's a, a strong story. point of view it's a strong point of view in this and we know what the story is and we know how to tell it and and yes we could have a huge influence on that and the and this captain of this pot <laughs> may have a very specific thing that that they want the music to help with um but it's it's not like a blank slate you know right. that there's a certain now mission that has that you're joining the mission and you're going to contribute to this mission now in my world then that's a blank slate how do i contribute to that mission uh, what are the sounds? And it is, you know, you have that blank page in front of you once again, which is sometimes frightening. Uh, it's and still always, terrifying for you once in a while to look at a blank score. A while, I, gotta admit. I mean, I've, I've, I've gotten better <laughs> at it over the years, <laughs> but, and I have certain techniques, you know, if it's a, if I know I'm writing a traditional score, if they want that 32 bar theme, or if they want four different themes that at least are eight bars long, 16 bars long, so that you can then do a, collage at the end of all four themes you know mm -hmm. whatever that structure is if it's more traditional like that i'll sit at the piano just with a piece of paper and pencil or sometimes the the because you know the little dictaphone on mm -hmm. and just play stuff until i get until i feel that that represents this story or that represents this character and this character's arc i'm not one for making a theme for a character i mean there's a certain type of scoring that that's very effective for, I mean, Raiders of the Lost Ark, it works gangbusters, you know, there's no doubt about it. And the Death Star has its theme and that's perfect. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time though, it's the triumph of the rebels that you want to score. It's the love between these two people that you want to score. So 
that's one of the things that I'm figuring out in the very beginning. You know, what what is this music going to really represent to help tell the story? And is it in the is this a story that you're going to want to represent talk about tragedy because this you know, Judas and the Black Messiah, this this was a story this should not have happened. This is a story of our culture which this was a uh, an atrocity, right? So what are you how are you going to score that? How are you going to help tell that story? Uh, also, how are you going to let leave people so that they feel desperate and destroyed by the end so that you can give them maybe something that makes them say, all right, what can we do to make our lives better? There are things, you know, so you start to really wrestle with some of the big questions of storytelling mm -hmm. and what can the music do to contribute to that. And so in those first week or so, it's the sound. What is the sound and what are those notes? And certain types of scoring, all you need is a three note motif and a fantastic sound design <laughs> are the scores you need for different 32 bar themes. You know? right. Right. And, it, and it's a stylistic choice. And hopefully in that first couple of weeks, you make the right stylistic choice so that you can then follow it through undeterred. <laughs> uh, but I've had, you know, I've made that choice and I've been told, you know, that's not really working. I had to go 180 degrees and make, try the other approach or an, another approach. Mm -hmm. So those first two weeks are exploratory. Right. And I like to come out of those first two weeks with 10 to 15 minutes of music that really represents what I feel the sound of this score, the message of this score is that's going to help tell the story. So what is your schedule? Boy, that, by the way, that's so clearly expressed. Thank you for that. Yeah. What are your, your first two weeks like schedule wise? And what do you come out with? Do you, are you, I know that you've actually, you're one of the early innovators, but also just devotees of synthesizers and electronic music, yeah. you know, and, and when I read that about you, uh, I remember that I had the good fortune when I was in junior college in Miami that somebody came in and taught electronic music and Ooh. we were starting to learn to program also. And even, you know, write out a score and then rip it up and throw all the pieces of paper in the air and come down and put it back together in any order and then play that. And, you know, sure. experimental music, you know, sure. where you come from as well, in addition to you growing up as a classical musician and, and then embracing jazz, you know, becoming a jazz yeah. artist as well. But what do you come out, since you've got all these tools, you know, these abilities, do you use your samplers and, and your your string libraries and your live trumpet or bring in a nylon guitar or whatever it is to to flesh out your ideas? Or or do you, do you stay in kind of more sketched mode? It depends on the style of the score. Okay. If, I, if I'm doing something that is definitely traditional or has a traditional element. I still don't even go into the studio. I go into my, my uh, family room where I have a beautiful, my mother's beautiful Steinway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> actually, Great. my grandmother's beautiful Steinway. The one you learned on? <laughs> the one I learned on. Actually, I didn't learn on. I would go and play it when we'd visit my grandmother. When ah, because it was still at your grandmother's house. Yeah, yes. my grandmother's house. And then she, she left it to me. So I have that, and it's a beautiful piano. And I, so it stays in the house, so it's, people have access to it and can play it. But I'll just grab, I'll grab a pad of paper and a pencil, and I'll just sit there for, you know, a couple of days and just come up with, because I still feel that the piano can represent an orchestra. Mm -hmm. And I feel that I'm much, I have no inhibitions about the quality of sound in front of a piano. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful piano. Piano is part of our vocabulary. It's part of the DNA of our culture at this point. And, and I'm very comfortable creating music that I know will translate to orchestra wonderfully. Right. Um, or small ensemble or whatever it is, but it's music in the organic nature. It's music of, of the traditional nature, melodies, harmonies, you know. Um, if I know that the score is going to be modern, experimental, then it's right into the studio and it's, all right, what's the sound of this movie? And it's literally just play three notes on this patch, on this patch, record it and play it backwards, record it and tune it in 15 different things and cut it and put it together. Is that the sound? You know, what it, 
go into that experimental music mode and mm -hmm. find out, all right, what's the texture that belongs with those pictures? You know, what is that? What is that sound? And then hopefully pretty quickly, I will come to some solution and some idea, right? And if, and uh, if it needs an acoustic piano superimpose that, then I use the sample piano and obviously now I'm in the construction zone. Right. The studio. <laughs> and, you know, over the years, uh, I've taken advantage of the technology like, like everybody else. And fortunately, I've been successful enough that I really can have a lot of different stuff at my disposal. You know, I've got a lot of different libraries and collected a lot of different instruments. And so if I want to get into the electronic music world, I've got pretty much everything you can think of right. and, uh, and access to, you know, big computer banks of stuff. And, uh, so yeah, and then then it's then you're more into the computer world of building music where you're building it up track by track and getting getting the idea of well this is gonna sound here if we have a bass, but we have this weird atonal shit, but then we have a a guitar in, in a ten second delay, mm -hmm. right, playing on top of that. That's the sound of this film. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know. So then let's set it up in the computer so that's easily got to, so that I can now start to play with those elements easily. The technology is not getting in the way. The technology right. is really helping me. Because that's, of course, the real key to this. Because I said creativity is, I don't know where it is, but it's <laughs> the whole job of any artist is to pull it out and put it into the physical universe the best way they can. Right, to channel it through you, yeah. through your I mean, experience. It and the, the body, it comes through the mind, into the body, and into the physical universe. So right. whether you're a writer with a typewriter or you know, word processor or you're a composer with a keyboard into a sequencer. Or, it has or your, your wife Donna with a paintbrush. With a paintbrush, exactly. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and so you want that line, that line to be as distraction and uh, impediment free as possible. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, technology can be our friend and it can also be our bitter enemy <laughs> when it decides to not really be working correctly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's very crucial to me is one of the reasons that I take, take money and have a, have a guy, right? I have a guy in my studio whose job it is to make sure. And I'll say, look, this is the vocabulary. This is what we're going to be working in. I right. want you to clean it. I want you to make sure that it works well, that everything, you know, that I'm not going to run into any problems. The sampler is going to all handle it. Right. You know, any license, you know, what, any problem that could come in to make this not work, just clean it up for me. <laughs> so that have then you had that the same, have, have you had the same guy or a person for a long time, or is it hard to find that person? It's, I don't know if it's hard to find. I mean, Los Angeles, there's so many talented Good people. point, yeah. We're, we're rich I've with. been very lucky. I've, I've had, let's see, one, two, three. I'm on my fourth guy, mm -hmm. but that's 25 years. Yeah. 30 years. So most of these guys are there like 10 years. Mm -hmm. The fourth guy's only been there two years. So if you look at it, the first guy was there like five years. The other two guys were there for a long, long time, over 10 right. years. Because it's what we have fun. I, I mean, that's... That's why I like what you said, man. You, you made fun a big item on that list, and it and it's true. It it has to be fun. It is, and and you know, I've been reminded of that. I I used to music direct for late night talk shows, uh, mm. and so I was surrounded by a world class band. I'm mm -hmm. sure musicians who've you worked you've worked Abraham Laborie on bass, you know, like the oh, best yeah. of the best, and yeah. and Luis Conte, and and all these wonderful oh, wow. people. Yeah. Um, but they used to remind me you know, before we would start the show, because my head would sometimes be about to explode. I had a, an earpiece in, there's people yelling at me, I'm hearing direction and, <laughs> you know, and camera one ready and all this stuff that I didn't need to hear. And they would, you know, oftentimes just put their hand on, on my shoulder before we started and just say, don't forget, you know, don't <laughs> let's don't, we're all having, we're having a ball here. Yeah. We want to make sure you do as well. We've, you've already done the work. Yeah. So just have, just play. We got you, you know, yeah. we'll follow you wherever you go. And, and it was a beautiful reminder, you know, not to miss out on those moments um, because it is fun to create music and certainly to perform, you know, you've been a performer your whole life. You've, you've moved away from it. I know that you miss it uh, yeah. performing. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that reconnected us 
was we both recently were at the NAMM show in, in Anaheim, California, for the 40th anniversary of MIDI. And we were both performing on, on the main stage right. at the end of the, the show. And it was so great to hear hear you play and and, and watch your multimedia <laughs> performance with with images behind you and playing synthesizer and trumpet. And one of my questions to you, and then I want to go back to like your early years and the the just the arc of your journey, because it's been very interesting and, and people might be surprised at some of the things that you did and all the various different ways that you could have gone um, with your music and with your career. But, um, you know, the thing that I wanted to ask you is, did you at a young point know that this was something that you just loved or, or was it something you just did and you were out playing baseball and riding your bike and all that as well? At, at what point did you feel like you wanted to really wrap your life around art and music? <laughs> yeah, I think it was pretty early on. I don't remember a time mm -hmm. when it wasn't a, a big part of my life. Uh, violin was okay. okay. My mother was a violinist, so it was more doing mm -hmm. thing to, to please her. But she would take me to a lot of orchestral rehearsals, you know, and I would sit and do my homework during, mm -hmm. her, during her rehearsal. And I, I'll never forget the, the day that I started wandering around and was backstage and saw the orchestra from the back. And I heard the trumpet section. I said, now that's much better than the violin. <laughs> that, that I could really get into. <laughs> and, and then one season, Christmas season, she did like the Bach oratorio, the, the mm -hmm. oratorio, the Bach Christmas oratorio. And that, of course, has the most sublime trumpet yeah. parts in the world. And I heard that. Said, well, that's it. That's what I want to do. So I told her I want to play trumpet. And she said, no. And <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what, I'll play both. I'll play violin and trumpet. So for for three years or two years, I played both violin and trumpet. And then she saw that I was loved the trumpet and she she acquiesced. Was your dad <laughs> musical as well? He was. He was never a professional at it. My mother was a professional. She she had made her living as a violinist and and taught, and performed uh, her entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was an amateur violist. In fact, that's how they had met. They were playing string quartets together mm -hmm. in college. That's great. Uh, so yeah, he and so he always loved it. He was always my my number one fan. And, and then you moved to San Francisco uh, when you got older, and you started getting more involved in jazz and pop and rock and playing in local bands like so many of our guests have done and, and I did as well. Uh, and during the seventies at the height of, you know, switched on Bach and, you know, right. um, Wendy Carlos Walter at the time, um, a true innovator in so many levels of oh, music and life. Uh, but you got into programming synthesizers. You know, one of the really cool things I think about your career is then you basically got into it's, you know, your, your bio says you left classical music. I don't know that you ever left. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so much a part of you, but you left that world and became a touring and session musician, you know, working with Pharrell Sanders and Charles Lloyd, but also with the Beach Boys and Van Morrison. So you were like both feet in with pop and, and jazz, like in the deep end of the pool was that must have been a really fun and and uh, and a prosperous time as far as creativity, like really working with all of these phenomenal artists. What was that like for you? It, it was pretty great decade that that for me because uh, I was still played a, a bit of classical music. I was still good enough that I could play. I, I did one. I did the Verdi Requiem with Seiji Ozawa in the San Francisco Symphony, which I'll never forget. I mean, that yeah. was quite something was that recorded I uh i don't think it was recorded, okay unfortunately um what else uh, i played in the opera uh the san francisco opera uh i played in the oakland symphony quite a number of times as their mm -hmm. utility fourth trumpet player so i still had my feet in the, in the classical game right but i decided that it wasn't going to be my life's work you know for a moment, I thought I was going to be a classical soloist and a, a specialist in Baroque music and mm -hmm. music of Bach, because that, that trumpet music is just so sublime. It's exquisite. Yeah. yeah. But but quite frankly, it was all Miles Davis' fault. You know what I mean? <laughs> I heard a Miles record, and that was it. I said, well, if a trumpet can do that, 
<laughs> I think that that's worthy of a little more exploration. And and so, really, all through my my twenties, I was I was using my classical technique to help pay the rent uh, right. and enjoy the experience. I mean, the experience of working with Ozawa was quite something. Yeah, must have been. Uh, but I was exploring, you know, jazz, and I was going to clubs and and. You know, this was long before the days of Berkeley School of Music or YouTube or anything. So if you right. wanted to learn this stuff, you had to go out and find the cats that were doing it and say, tell me what that shit is. You know, I want to know what that scale is. You know? <laughs> and so I would do that. I would go and find some approachable looking player and just say, look, can I take a lesson and, and go take a lesson? And, and so I would meet, met a lot of great players and ended up playing in some really good bands, you know, and... All across, like you said, all across the genres, all the way from Pharaoh Saunders, all the way up through. Uh, well, I was in the band called the Sons of Champlin. Oh, was, wow! With Bill Champlin, of course. Um, but I was sitting in with Carlos Santana. And yeah. Just a lot of. I did a record with Jerry Garcia. I mean, mm -hmm. really, all across the board. And then, of course, I met Van, and that started a long relationship with Van Morrison. Right. Not to mention David Sylvian, Was Not Was, Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, Suzanne Vega, Ecstasy, Willie Nelson, Joni Mitchell, who you re recently reconnected with? Oh, I just recently reconnected with Joni. I did the uh, Gershwin Award. Uh, oh, right. Her, and I'm headed up to the Gorge in about a week and a half to play with her up there with Brandy Carlaw. Oh, that's going to be so great as a featured trumpet player. Yeah. Mm, so full circle. It is very much so. I'm so thrilled that she has literally refound her voice. It's, it's such a such a blessing to this world to have her yeah. back. You know, mm -hmm. And it's really Brandy has been the one. I mean, Brandy just started these jam sessions and, and inspired Joni. And every time we go and do it again, Joni's doing more and singing more and playing guitar again. And it's it's really quite a, a miraculous. Yeah. Know, and sounding so good sounding just exquisite you know her voice right, is exquisite exquisite her voice is probably an octave lower but it sounds just gorgeous i mean she's yeah. a contralto now but boy what a sound what a yeah. sound it's just magnificent you know there's there are the the greats the great singers who are of age you know a yeah. little bit older than us and Tony Bennett, Barry Manilow, Melissa Manchester, Joni now, of yeah. course, um, have never sounded better. Bruce Springsteen, he's still. I, I well, Van, I went and saw Van a while ago. I mean, he's still just killing. Right. Yeah. Killing. It's like a fine bottle of wine, right? Exactly. It does. You know, there's, there's something beautiful about I guess I'm a little <laughs> on the fence to say this. People who take care of their voices, because Joni notoriously has smoked cigarettes her whole life and all that, but but she's taken care of herself. You know, she's recovering from uh, some really debilitating physical challenges. Yeah, and she's and she is doing a good job. She has a great uh, therapist who's you know physical therapist who's just make sure that she does everything she needs to do every day. And, and mm -hmm. it's paying off because she's just stronger and stronger and stronger. Wow. That's so great. I, I'm excited that she's also playing guitar again. You know, she's certainly been an influence on me, you know, as a player. Yeah. 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 And, and the really altered cool. tuning rabbit hole. I just exactly. love. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> she's the master of that. She, is, she really uh, is. She yeah. really, truly is. Um, I want to talk about you collaborating with your wife, who's an artist. But before we do that, um, I, there's a couple of other things. One is that you are a collector of trumpets and, and vintage synthesizers. And um, I think I saw a photo of, of a piece, you know, a piece of furniture in your house that's got all these beautiful brass instruments in it. Oh, uh, yeah. And... Uh, do you have a, a like a favorite story about finding a a great old trumpet in a pawn oh. shop, or it's just something you chased down or gifted to you or stumbled upon? Uh, 
Well, there's a couple like that. There's the the very first horn that I ever bought with my own money. My parents were were very supportive of my trumpet career. <laughs> so they bought the first student or rented the first student horn. And then when I saw that I could play, they bought me a, a, a nice horn. And they even bought me my first classical trumpet. So I had three different trumpets before I moved out of my parents' house. That's it's, pretty amazing, actually. It is. It's, they were so supportive of me in that. Mm-hmm. But then I was on the road for the trumpet that Miles played, right? I wanted the Martin Committee model. And I, I was working at a, as a music store, cleaning the floors and cleaning band instruments and, and the, just the dog's body down there. And, mm-hmm. and into the shop one day, a guy came with a Martin Committee model. And it was a little beat up, but I could afford it. And so I bought it. And I still have and play as my main trumpet that horn today. It's been rebuilt uh, twice, the last time by Bob Malone, who is now designs all of the Yamaha trumpets, which are considered some of the finest in the world. Yeah. But this is before he went to Yamaha and he had a shop in LA and he rebuilt this horn and it, it, the horn just plays so beautifully. And it's, it's, it gets me closer to that Miles sound, which said, well, boy, if a trumpet could sound like that, I think I have to play the trumpet. <laughs> Did did you um, have any personal experiences with Miles over the years? No, I never did. I never did. Um, I've talked, obviously, met a lot of people who played with him. I've I've met uh, almost all the guys from the quartet. I never met. I met briefly Ron Carter, but I played with Herbie. I played with Wayne. I played with Tony Williams. But um, no, I never met Miles. Mm-hmm. I would have liked to, although I I don't know. <laughs> I hear meeting Miles could be a, a, a wonderful experience and a terrifying experience. Yeah, and but you know we've both heard those from a, you know a lot of people who we've ended up working with, where the experiences generally were really wonderful. You know yeah. that I, I remember the first time I met Al Jarreau, and I was kind of pre warned. Well, you know he might and and or Anita Baker, and but they couldn't have been nicer. And the experiences couldn't have been more connected and musical and and trusting. So, the one sort of interaction there was is actually pretty funny, and it's mm-hmm. very Miles like. I I was interviewed by a guy for a film score, right? I even forget what which one it was, but it's going back now. And and somewhere in the interview, he turned to me and said, "You know, it might be interesting for you to know. I inter- interview I just did before you." last week was with Miles Davis because he had just scored his first and only film score or second film score Mm -hmm. that he's ever I said wow that's fantastic I mean what was he like blah 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 and he said and then then at the end of that conversation he said you know I mentioned to Miles that I was going to be interviewing you this week and he said you want to know what he said I said of course I want to know what he said he said that motherfucker's been stealing my shit for years so I'm going to steal some of his (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that that's fantastic. <laughs> it's so miles, but it's probably it's the greatest compliment ever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that so one goes down in the actually, books, right? He'd, he'd actually heard of me, and he'd heard of my scores and my trumpet yeah. playing. It was it was quite a that's, quite a moment for me. It's pretty wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your collaboration with Donna, your wife, because right. you both are artists. You both have different um, practices, you know, visual yeah. art. Well, but you're both in visual arts because you're a film, film composer as well. Um, so what is your collaboration like? Because I, I, I know it, I mean, I know it's wonderful that you get to do that. So it, it, I'm sure it doesn't come without its challenges as well. Well, yeah. And the first, the first challenge, we talked about it a lot and She's a, a fine artist. She's a painter. Mm-hmm. And so we kept thinking, we kept going around with ideas, but nothing seemed to mesh. And I was trying to figure out why. And then I realized at least I could articulate what the problem was. And the problem was that time is a crucial factor in what I do. Mm-hmm. In other words, what I create is one event after the other. And the impact you get is by listening to it over a period of time. It can just be a few seconds or it can be an hour and a half. Right. But time is one of the factors that of my creation. In a still painting, there's no time. 
right? You, it's, you, it's, it's really whatever time you want to spend in front of the painting. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a single image, and it's you place it in your space and you absorb it. And any time experience is your the time experience that you put into it, right? I said, well, that's see a fundamental difference between what we're doing here. So how do, how do we do that? So we've been experimenting with how to put time into her work. And the first thing we did was, was uh, digitize a bunch of her stuff and, and, and start to put you know, animation into it. And that's something we're still playing with, but we're having more success with the idea of projection against her paintings in that we actually come up with a projection of imagery that has time into it, i.e. film, and project that against her still image. And then the projected time-oriented imagery can have time-oriented sound with it. And it doesn't have to be in sync with it, but at least now you have you have a still image, you have an image moving in time, and then you have sound moving in time. And you can play those three things against each other. And all of a sudden now, you have an environment where you don't, the person in front of the image does not have to supply time on their own. Time is being given to them as you are being given it in a film or in music. And it's been really fun and very successful so far. We took it to Miami uh, Basel. To the Art Basel show, correct? Yeah, yeah. Got Aqua last year, and and people loved it. People just really loved that's, it. That's that's the perfect venue for the two of you. I've I've been to the show. I'm, I was born and raised in Miami, but I but a few years back, one of my friends brought me to the show because it didn't exist when I was growing up, and it's just such, such a energetic uh, collection of artists, global artists. Well, and, it is. It's very yeah. exciting. You see some amazing stuff being being done there. Yeah, and it's huge. It's so it's like oh Isn't my. It? God. <laughs> <laughs> so, are, are you also playing live for some of those uh, performances, not or not? Not yet. I, okay, I, I've been discussing that that would be a possibility. Um, I, I want to get in. I want to expand the projection ideal first. Mm -hmm. Just it would be nice to to take over a space in a large way right I think with a slightly larger space i don't know we, we keep we keep discussing it i keep thinking i need a slightly larger space for the performance aspect to work but then i hear myself saying that and i'm not sure that's true so i don't know we're we're still experimenting <laughs> well from from watching and, and hearing your live interactive performance at the nam show you, you know that just works so beautifully, you know, images behind you and you playing keyboards and, but also playing trumpet. And I could see that. I mean, it worked certainly on a large stage with a big audience outdoors, but that would work in a coffee house, you know, like in a, yeah. in an art gallery. It would. Well, and, the, and the intimacy about that, I think I, I'd be so intrigued. I'd love to be in the room for either one of those things, but that adding, you know, a little bit of live element. Cause I think it would be not that you're asking for my advice, <laughs> but, but well, um, I, love, I love hearing people's thinking about this. Cause it's, I just it said, all... I think the, I, you know, just the joy that comes from watching you put the trumpet to your lips comes through because uh -huh. it's such, such an integral part of who you are as, as an artist, as a musician, as a, as a human. So, you know, I, I love that. I loved hearing, that was my favorite part of watching you from the side of the stage was, was when you were playing trumpet. Oh, well, it's just great. You. Yeah. Thank those, you. those moments where you were doing that because it's just so authentic. It's so, you know, magnificent because you've been doing it for so long and in so many ways that, um, you know, who doesn't, and you know, and the thing is also it's personal. Like, you know, one of the things that I think that's changed in our culture is artist is, is the, not the mystery, but the accessibility. Like people want to know who you are, you know, it, it cause they yeah. connect, they yeah. connect. And it's not, not like everything personal about your life, but, but to just know a little bit more about you through your playing or through your, the interviews you do, the, the mentoring that you do, all the, the, the things that you do. I just say you play more trumpet, <laughs> you know, when you, anytime you can do. 
Thanks. you know, because it's pretty wonderful. Yeah, I think if if I if we do that, then it makes it like feel like it's a bit it's like a concert, and that's fine with me. I love co concerts. Yeah, uh, a lot of what we're we're trying to do is make something a little more immersive that you could sure. space that you could walk into. You could still have the idea like in a gallery where your time is part of the experience, the time you place yourself in different positions. Um, yeah. And maybe there's there's no reason the performance can't be part of that too. Yeah, and and like you said, part of the ex the immersive experience, yeah. not the whole experience. It's just another course in the meal. Yeah, exactly. you know that at one point there's like there's that. a little I bit like of yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah. Can you, by the way, if anybody in our audience is interested in making a comment or um, if, if you have a question for Mark, now would be a great time to to request an invite, and I'll bring you up on stage. Uh, what do you remember about your very first film scoring experience and also your very first recording experience? You know, because it's nothing can prepare you for either of those experiences. Yeah. It's not in a book or, you know, <laughs> or a class. Well, my first film scoring experience was, was, well, it had its trying moments, but I was shepherded into the business by a gentleman who I just adore, uh, and he's he's iconoclastic and plays definitely follows his own drummer and is not you know he he i think made five films for hollywood and then just said oh to hell with it <laughs> but that's the great carol ballard i mean he just he makes beautiful beautiful films and um and you know the studios didn't want him hiring this young guy who'd never skilled scored a film before you know they said are you kidding what are, what are you doing you know? he said nah this is the guy he's gonna be great he's gonna be great and he's so supportive and he really shepherded me through the whole experience and he put really talented people around me to advise and and uh and help with orchestrations and editing and all sorts of stuff um it wasn't without its trial because i'd never taken a class in film scoring or any, at all so i was really learning by doing it on the job and but carol was willing for me to do that I and mean, i worked harder than i may have ever worked well that's not true i've, I've since worked just as hard but it's yeah. this is seven days a week 12 13 14 hours a day you know just because i don't know what i'm doing and i if those first three days i get nothing accomplished i have to make up for that and by mm -hmm. working you know so um but I came out the other end with a with a really good film score that that still survives and plays really well to this day, and um, I owe a lot to the guys that were around me and supported me. But it's mm -hmm. uh, it was good. Do, it was when good. you were in in school in music school, did you were you focused on orchestration and arranging and conducting and composition, or was it all performance based? It was mostly performance based. Yeah, I took right. one conducting class and was just. I don't remember being. I think I was actually. Couldn't even be scared. I was so scared. You know what I mean? All I, <laughs> I did. Was, all all I could do was sort of laugh nervously and say, "Well, I'm not doing that again." <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it it took me literally fifty years to actually get in front of a, uh, and I still I haven't conducted a full orchestra. I've, I, I've conducted the uh, army band on one performance. How was, did you enjoy that? I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it. It was a piece of my own, which I knew very well. And I knew that they played it really well. Mm -hmm. And I knew that even if I sort of fainted, they would still keep going and get to the end, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is at least if you know that you <laughs> But they were they were very gracious and, and I think I did an okay I, I did an okay job. So <laughs> I've since I've taken I have taken conducting lessons and I think I could probably do it. But it's not one of those things it's never been a life's dream for me to, to conduct. I find that um, I'm the producer of my film scores and it's much more efficient if I can listen right from the first take. Right. And if I'm conducting an orchestra you can hear it in the room and you can make the corrections in the room, but it has actually at the end of the day has very little to do with what it sounds like in the booth. Right. And the director or the producer is sitting in the booth and the director or the producer aren't smiling. <laughs> I want to know that right away. I want to know that within those first two bars because 
I got to fix something there. And, Absolutely. and wait and come in and, and look at them discussing in the back room if they're going to fire me today or tomorrow, <laughs> then I'm already too late. Right. You know? So just from a pure production point of view, I don't conduct. I sit in the booth. I watch my director. I watch my producer. I listen. So that by the time that first pass has gone down, I've already got my notes. I've already read their indicators and stuff, what they, what they like and what they don't like. And we can really get about the business of fixing it and making it perfect. Right. You you can address it accordingly because that's where your complete focus is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the the art of being a producer is truly an art. It is. It is. And I've been so fortunate to work with some of the best in the business. So I've mm-hmm. tried to learn learn from them. Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> When was the first time you you put one of your trumpets through a guitar pedal? I actually did that when I was still in high school. You did? <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. And was it a, a phaser, a phase shifter, or a distortion uh, pedal? Do you remember? It was an octave divider. Oh, nice. Yeah. I was working, or it might have been right after high school, because it was when I was working at the music store. Mm-hmm. I was the, the floor sweeper and the and the uh, clarinet swabber <laughs> yeah. music store. and Which, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm always so fascinated by the things that we all did, all of my guests, <laughs> you know, f- over the last seven years, like the first year, the first year in L.A., the first everything. So I'm so happy to hear you talking about sweeping floors and, you know, yeah. and cleaning clarinet pads and... <laughs> exactly, stocking shelves. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, but it was, I was in the right environment because... The company no longer existed, exists, but it was a company that was making octave dividers for instruments. And they thought, mm-hmm. you know, that that if you put an octave divider on a on a trumpet or a clarinet, it would be cool and hip to play. Yeah. And and so because I was the young instrumentalist that worked at the store, the owner of the store would get this stuff in and say, "I don't know what this is. What is this?" And I'd, <laughs> oh, I get to take it home and figure out what it was. <laughs> and that gave me a pickup. And then I bought a Wawa pedal. Mm-hmm. So those were the first two things I ran the trumpet through. It was a was a uh, octave and a rider and a Wawa pedal. It's fantastic. Yeah. Before I get to my closing questions, I I have a really important question to you, and and it's simply this: yeah. Is there anything that you never get to really talk about in interviews that you would like to? talk about right now anything come to mind that you'd want to share about yourself or about the craft or the life that oh. you are living or the life that you're observing when you travel around the world and uh, I don't know you posed this question a, a few days ago and I've been thinking about it I've been I've been very fortunate that uh, I've spoken pretty freely about pretty much everything that I've I don't really feel there's anything I uh, won't talk about or can't yeah. talk about. Um, I've noticed in, in interviews that I've seen of yours over the years that you're always really clear and you say what's on your mind and what's on your heart. So um, you've, you've, I, I'm not surprised to hear you say that. <laughs> I just think that the one of the things I have learned, uh, especially in the film business, but it, you learn it in the film business because it's it's do or die by this. Um, yeah. And I think it is in life, too, except the film business sort of slaps you in the face with it, and you can observe this. And it's harder just in life, or certainly in the music business, it's much harder to see this. But the communication with other people and one's ability to actually do that as a skill is really, really important. And it's something that I have never seen taught anywhere. Well, that's not completely true because I've learned it. Uh, I've learned it through studying Scientology. But oh, okay. But there are so life skills. It's life skills, you know. Absolutely. This, there, there's no, you know, you take a communication class and you're studying about radio and, and and things like that. But really, you know, how do you tell something to somebody? Make sure they duplicate it make them happy that they've duplicated and then allow them to respond and duplicate that. I mean, there's a real skill to that. And if you don't have it pretty down in Hollywood, that's what's going to get you in trouble. This isn't that you can't do your job necessarily. 
it's it's that you can't talk to them. I mentioned a team, right? I mentioned that there's this ongoing team that is doing this work, that's creating this work. Well, if you can't talk to them effectively, then you actually won't be on the team very long. And of course, then of course, then it's just very simple to say, well, you know, why is my kid won't talk to me? Well, maybe there's, you should learn to talk to them better first, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just, I just notice it now everywhere, the, the, the dynamic everywhere I go is, it's very just interesting. Look at the various different levels of skill that various different people have in the, actually in the art of communication. And it's really, it's, it's a pretty interesting thing, you know, and to improve it for oneself, I think is the most valuable thing you can do. Yeah. It's, it's so critical and it's, it's not generally taught in school, certainly no. not in music school or even in, I don't remember being taught it in junior high school or high school in elementary school, we were taught how to be a better person, but then you just sort of, it, it sort of gets, you know, let go. Uh, yeah. Later on as we're older, when actually that would be a really good time to really be focusing and and getting input and guidance on how to be a better person, how to be the kind of person that somebody would want to be around. You know, certainly when it comes to to film scoring, touring, yes. you, know, you know, you want to people want to be surrounded by people that they want to be around, especially when you're in the trenches together. You know, writing music for film, being on a bus, you know, yeah. driving around the country or flying around the world, you know. You want to be around people you like. So it's important to learn how to be likable and and to be interested in more than just yourself, <laughs> you know, to be interested in the people and the experiences that are around you. And and like you, I mean, you led the conversation w about just the importance of being part of a team. You know, you're not the composer and it all revolves around you. Your job is to really integrate your skill set and your perspective and your your talent and your willingness to be open and and read the room like you said even in this in the session i mean certainly you do it all the way along so that you're you're extremely prepared before you even start writing a note you know and, and going through that process but even then with all of your experience you are still looking around the room to see how what more can you do to serve the story? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's an art and, yeah. and, and an extremely important part of being an artist and, and being successful. And, and as you said, it's not just about music. That's just if, you know, at your job at the grocery store or sweeping the floor at the music store. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, I do and, think it's the most important skill. I mean, to go back to this, the subject of your show, I mean, it's the most important skill that I think I could recommend to anybody in terms of just being successful. And it, and the good news is it's successful at anything, but especially in the arts, in, in music and in film. Well, that leads to the first of my three closing questions that I ask all, all right. of my guests. And because and, you, it's really what it's about. What, since this show is called Making It, what does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? Ah, uh, well, I think there's various different levels of that. I do, I do have, you know, sort of, uh, goals that are societal judgmental goals, like, you know, a nice house and a nice car and, be able to buy my wife nice things and <laughs> take nice vacations with the kids, things like yeah. that. I mean, I think there is definitely a sense of making it in, in being able to have those nicer things and a nice lifestyle. And But, you know, as an artist, there is a whole other level of what is really satisfying to me as, as a creator of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's a legacy of work, you know, um, but I also look at my life and I look at the four children I have and I, I say, you know, these four, four kids are growing up 
doing better at the ages they are that I was at, at that age. And therefore, I have improved. I'm get managed, and I had a very fine life. This is no complaint against the way I was raised. I was raised in a beautiful household with all sorts of opportunities. Right, loving, supportive parents. Yeah, but just through the nature of who they are and who we've, my wife and I, and this environment we've created, I'm very proud of the children and the family I'm, I'm raised, helping raise. You've bumped it up another notch. Yes, yeah. And I think that's sort of the goal of, hopefully, society, you know, is right. to make, make ex every successive decade better than the last. You know? Right, absolutely. What's, what's the age range of your four kids? 32 to 19. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one's, one's still at home or out of the house? One is still at, at home, but three of them live at home. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, COVID, well, COVID brought everybody home, right? Didn't it? So all of us yeah. were living, living during COVID. Um, two of them were living away, and we just, and one of them in New York, and my wife said, get home now before the <laughs> plane stopped flying. Right. And, uh, and so they were all home for COVID. And then one of uh, the oldest got married, and so he he, he left. But the, everyone else has stayed, which is really fun because one is my middle son is a singer songwriter, and he's built a studio over in the guest house. And my youngest son is a filmmaker, so he's got a cutting room up in the attic. And it, it's like an artist colony around our house. <laughs> it's really right. Fun. Oh, that's so fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Well, I mean, who else would you rather have isolated with than? Well, and Donna and friends. your four children. <laughs> they're our best friends. So we, yeah. Oh, that's so great. We're very, very happy. Can my second question is, can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Well, that's just funny. I actually can. And it, it is three and I call them the three P's. Really? Oh, this is <laughs> yeah. so great. Perfect. Um, I am old enough that I do get asked this question. So, I, and it just came to me, you know, one time when I was asked that question that, that they're all, and they all start with P produce. If you're a composer, compose. If you're a painter, paint. If you're a writer, write. Just don't sit around in coffee shops and say, I'm a composer, you know, stay at home and bloody compose, you know, write a symphony, right? get your laptop out and, and write 15 beats and, and then, you know, sample a vocal. I mean, whatever it is, get on with it and actually do it, produce something right. and then promote, tell people that you've done it, play it for people, show it to people, promote it, get it out there into the world. And then really the only other thing that you have to do is just persist. You just have to keep doing those two things. You have to make something and you have to put it out in the world. Because the more you put out into the world, it increases your chances of getting stuff back from the world. Inflow equals outflow. And it's just that simple. And eventually, I mean, it might, there might be some nights when it's, you know, I've written 15 symphonies and 18 songs and, and nobody's listening. But then they will. Something will click. There'll be that connection. That flow out will, will generate a flow back. I, I've i never seen anything else in this. I mean, some people it happens right away. Other people it doesn't happen right away. But there's no other rule that makes it happen. You know, there's no right. other thing that enters in the game that make that does make it happen. That Those are the rules. So produce, promote, persist. Yeah. Great tips. Yeah. That and, was, you know, what? what's your observation about, you know, like you said, you some people like break through quickly, others have the, a longer journey to get there. I, it, to me, it seems like there's, there's a random factor as well, not just based on talent and, and showing up and doing the work. What, what do you see? You've been doing this for a long time and worked with a lot of successful people. And what do you see? Well, some of it does have to do with doing the right thing at the right time. Um, and you can think about that, you know, and as long as you come up with a, an observed, 
like I think anybody that invents anything and wants to sell it, you have to look at the marketplace, right? If you look at this now from a business perspective, right? You want to sell, I'm looking at my laptop right now. Okay. You want to sell laptops. Well, you better look at the marketplace at who's selling laptops. What can they do? What can't they do? How much do they cost? Blah, blah, blah. There's a part of being an artist that you can't ignore that completely, you know? If I'm going to turn around and say, well, I am going to do madrigals for viola and lute, and I'm going to write 5,000 of them, <laughs> there's, there's probably, you may not get a big reaction to that, because you look at the marketplace, <laughs> and there's not a big market for madrigals for viola and lute, right? But if you say, I'm going to do a collaboration between this 15-year-old rap artist and this you know Brazilian a flamenco guitar player with this percussionist from New York and we're going to do you know this incredibly rhythmic you know world music whatever the whatever you'd want to call it well there could be very well a very cool market for that and if you get a great pop producer you could have a bloody hit you know mm -hmm. so there's a certain amount of marketing <laughs> that I think any artist has to keep looking at you know, and just keep be aware of what's going on out there. Be aware of other things that are being played for other people. So when you play your stuff for people, you know where you're going to fit in. Right. And then pick what you of what you do, what that passion is, the thing that you described so eloquently at the beginning of the show, what that thing is that you've discovered in yourself, but find the part of that that fits in the marketplace the best. Otherwise, it's just harder. It just is. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to re-record the Bach second Brandenburg Concerto with me on trumpet. Well, that's fine. <laughs> and I would have a great, you know, win if I could actually do it. Right? Mm -hmm. But that piece has been recorded hundreds and hundreds of times by players who are younger, look better on album covers. I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But if I came up with a, a hybrid of, of trumpet through the wah wah, the trumpet through the wah wah pedal is still pretty new, even 45, 50 years later from when I first, Miles, Agreed. First, you know? Yeah. So, you know what I mean? I you did. look at the marketplace and, and you pick intelligently something that you do that's going to have a, the best shot. Right. And still stay authentic to yourself. Well, but, that's the but understand the environment that you're creating within. See, find your place and and see, yeah. and then, and then if you still want to do it, do it. Just understand. Don't like you well, said. You don't need to do five thousand of those. <laughs> you could do one of those. But but you can look at the. There's any number of singers who have looked around and say, "Look, I just love Tony Bennett and I love the singers of the great songs." And there's been every generation has had several singers who've been able to go out and sing standards. Yeah, and yeah. he's very 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 successful. Absolutely. So just because you're picking something that might be considered esoteric, you know, or a throwback, doesn't mean that it, you know, that it won't work. You know the the degree to which you might you know, the amount of success monetarily you might have you know might be judged by that choice but right but you when know, you when you mention singers like that like you know harry connick jr michael buble um yeah. i mean there's there are there are many yeah now i'm feeling oh, like I'm, i see a lot of young ones now on on social media who are stunning you know yeah and they still, yeah. but they bring, they're bringing to me, they're bringing in authenticity. That's and which, that's what, why they're going to be successful because right. the love of doing that is so apparent and it pulls Absolutely. you in and you yeah. want to experience what they have to say. Absolutely. Yeah. My closing question, and then I'll give you final thoughts is at this point of your life with everything that you know to be true. And I'm saying as a father, a husband, an artist, um, you know, a um, major film composer, but somebody who has accomplished a lot in your life. So at this point of your life with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? Oh. <laughs> you know, I would, I would, I think really this, I, I spent a lot of time sort of being, not a lot of time, but time just being stupid. You know? <laughs> 
And by that, I mean, you know, like taking drugs and, and just being, thinking I was being hip when I was really just being stupid. Oh, okay. You know, and getting, just getting my work ethic lined up a little quicker and a little sooner and really understanding that the real joy in life is from getting a job well done, you know, and getting that, that pro produce, promote and persist cycle going, you know? Right. The three P's. Yeah. And because I, I looked back and it, and look, I've, I've done really, I've done quite well. I can't complain about anything. But I think I, I just looked back at it. There was wasted time there that was just didn't do anybody any good. <laughs> and uh, I would just, I just wouldn't do that again. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Do you regret that you did those tell, things? I would tell my young self that. <laughs> right. Do you have regrets about doing some of those things or just a, a wisdom knowing now that those weren't really the best things? Those weren't in your best interest. You know, it's interesting because I've talked to my kids about this. Mm -hmm. you know, and they ask, because I would, I would tell them stories about some of this, the wilder shit that I did. Mm -hmm. They would say, oh, that was so cool. Well, I guess there was one or two things that were so cool. But, but to be honest with you, 95% of it was really not so cool at all. Right. And, and so I said, look, I really do, do think that it's a waste of your time. And you don't need to experience to learn that. You can just take my advice right and two out of the three kids did <laughs> <laughs> and, and right we'll still see where the 19 year olds at but um yeah. well, that's pretty <laughs> pretty good average he, it, he, was, he was he was gonna do a little more exploring on his own but he he's he came to me one day and said dad you're right okay yeah <laughs> no it's great that you, your relationship with your kids is um has that level of honesty and transparency yeah we've just we've really grown up with that you know we we communicate we talk mm -hmm. you know we just we don't let anything slip slip away and slide right. under the rug and stuff and and uh, it's been good and to raise them that way they've it's we've maintained that that's why living all under the same roof you know is still so much fun because we're really really good friends right so far, so good, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any closing thoughts before we end our conversation? We've done a great job here, Terry. Man, wow, how much fun has this been? This is really... It's a blast. Really, Are you kidding? Really cool. And I yeah. just, I loved your intro, and I think it's, I, I appreciate and agree with everything you said, and I hope I've been able to help amplify it and keep keep the, that uh, message alive here because it's you absolutely have I, I more than I knew we are we are very aligned in our um, approach to life you know um, and good. art good. and it's really lovely to hear your your perspective and for, and I thank you for sharing it uh, this has been a great conversation thank you for taking yeah. the time I know how busy you are uh, oh, it's my pleasure. My yeah pleasure. absolutely uh, I want to thank all of the our listeners and watchers. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us every week. And I encourage you to stay safe and stay inspired. And Mark, it's really been a joy to, to talk with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. Pleasure. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Woolman.